first talk uh, on the topic of the course, which is the super resolution and optical biopsy, uh, going through all the systems that could allow uh, an optical biopsy, that means, uh, as we will see immediately, the uh, mm, sampling of the tissue in the body without uh, active cutting or without aggressive uh, invasion to the body. Uh, and the second talk uh, will be related to the telepathology applications in the Amazonia regions on, in the underserved areas. Um, in here, as, uh, a ver, ¿cómo veo yo? Este es el de aquí. Ah, ok. In here, uh, as you will see, uh, there is an endoscopic capsule uh, of the later generation uh, that uh, have active moving and that uh, during the uh, presentation we will see that uh, it, oh, it is also able to take samples from the tissue. First of all, uh, we have to agree on the definition of uh, optical biopsy. Um, there are two types of optical biopsies. Initially, the term of optical biopsy has been applied for the spectroscopy. So nothing related with images. So that means very far from the domain of pathology uh, that we have been, let's see, repeating in here during the whole uh, presentations. Uh, the term of uh, optical biopsy, therefore, was done for things that you do not see and that you do not take outside of the body. And this was done just uh, through a spectroscopy. Uh, what is interesting is that now uh, methods that allow to see the tissue uh, allow to make the diagnosis that means that allow to make uh, the uh, biopsy and the diagnostic procedures on images that looks like the ones we have in the microscope. Uh, in fact, there are two big groups, the ones based on image, which are uh, related to pathology, and the ones not uh, related with images or not associated with images, which are not related to pathology in Spain and in some of the European countries, but in the states is inside of the field of pathology because morbid anatomy in the European countries are based on morphology, but pathology in the American countries is related with all the uh, biochemical labs and spectrographic uh, measurements. Therefore, uh, in America, this uh, spectroscopy is inside of the field of pathology. In Europe, uh, the only field of pathology is the ones which are based on images. As you can see in this uh, draw, uh, the images you can obtain have uh, different properties in the sense that, depending on the technology, they have more or less penetration in the body. Obviously, if you use MRI, so magnetic resonance, you can uh, observe the whole body. Uh, and the resolution that allows you, so that means the distance between the two points that is able to discriminate, comes from uh, 0.5 at the present moment on confocal uh, microscopy uh, to um, big uh, details uh, as it happens in uh, classical MRI because there are also uh, specific uh, types of MRIs that uh, also have uh, microscopic resolution. Uh, the interesting thing is that as much as you have resolution laterally, uh, less penetration you have in the technology. Therefore, 
uh, the uh, confocal microscopy have a very uh, uh, limited penetration, around 100 microns, uh, but have a very good lateral resolution, therefore looks like a microscope. And this is what you see. This is the reason why the confocal microscope is only possible uh, to be applied in surface, because your penetration is very limited. But there are other applications, uh, particularly ultrasound, uh, not CT or MRI, which are the classical fully penetrated uh, applications, but they are uh, uh, applications related with ultrasounds, and this is the PAM, the photoacoustic uh, microscopy, that have a very good penetration. A very good penetration means uh, three to five centimeters in the body, uh, but obviously uh, the lateral resolution is less, although it's very good because uh, 15 microns is a very good resolution. This is the case of the photoacoustic microscopy that we will see later on, in which you can see on the skin, uh, on a surface area, but inside, so deep on the surface area, you can see uh, a melanoma uh, area uh, are infiltrating the vessels which are in the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, what uh, or how we can uh, divide it, the uh, systems based on images, uh, we can divide it according this uh, have coherent light or non-coherent light, but obviously some type of uh, well quality light because it's, uh, the illumination is structured. Uh, or uh, mixed technology. The ones on coherent light is optical uh, um, coherence tomography, optical coherence imaging, and, uh, uh, and um, holography uh, imaging. And the uh, structure illuminate Illumination includes mainly confocal endomicroscopy, and the mixed technologies that we will see include the PAM, the photoacoustic uh, microscopy. And the methods not associated with images, as we will see immediately, are the spectroscopic methods. Uh, the topic of the course was super resolution. Why? Because most of these uh, systems, in fact, uh, reach a resolution which is over the uh, expected one. Uh, the uh, formula of resolution is that one, so two points can be discriminated uh, uh, when uh, the, uh, um, the um, uh, wavelength of the uh, light and the um, uh, numerical aperture of the optics uh, fulfill uh, this uh, formula, uh, in which the uh, two is uh, multiplied by the resolution system. So the classical ray length uh, formula is that one, but obviously uh, you can add uh, technology in order to increase the resolution, and this technology, uh, what affect is the end that uh, modify the resolution of the system. In the ring length criteria, two points can be discriminated if the, uh, if the uh, uh, first zero crossing of one of the points is inside of the uh, curve of the other points. Considering that contrast between these two points mm. is more than 26%, uh, so that means 30%. That means that in order to discriminate, you have to stain or you have to contrast or you have to do something. If there is no contrast, as it happens usually uh, in the body, uh, obviously you don't see nothing. Um, there is a, an issue uh, which is uh, fully exploited uh, at the present moment, uh, and that issue is that the tissue of the, some tissues of the body and some areas of the body have uh, autofluorescence. So you excite with a wavelength in generally 
uh, near infrared wavelengths, and then you get fluorescence from the uh, spontaneous fluorescence from the body. Obviously, if you get a spontaneous fluorescence, then uh, uh, you increase the contrast, and if this contrast uh, uh, reaches 30%, uh, then you are able to see uh, two different points. Another uh, very important issue, particularly in the field of pathology, uh, where it's very common to use CCD cameras or digital cameras, CCD cameras, but one chip CCD camera, so that means that the same chip uh, records uh, green, blue, and red uh, information. In general, it's two double green plus one red and plus one blue information. What it happens is that from the uh, resolution, spatial resolution of the chip, for example, if this is for uh, 1,000 per 2,000 pixels, uh, one-fourth of the pixel uh, belongs to a uh, direct uh, detector, uh, one-fourth belongs to the uh, blue detector, and uh, two-fourths belongs to the green detector. The green detector is the main detector. So what you are looking in here, this is a raw image, the classical raw image that you get on the cameras is this type of image, that obviously in order to see uh, in color, you have to combine the information regarding uh, red, uh, uh, blue, and green in order to see that image. And this is the uh, uh, combined uh, image of that one. As we will see immediately, the resolution, the spatial resolution is lost because you combine uh, some of the information. Uh, this is uh, what happened with, uh, you have a single chip camera, uh, which is sensible to the three colors. Uh, the most uh, developed cameras at the present moment are the phobions, in which you have three layers sensible to the uh, three colors at the same pixel. Therefore, you don't get this uh, divided by three resolution, but you get uh, a very nice resolution with this type of cameras. But these are not very common cameras in the uh, average uh, use in the laboratory. As you can see here, the uh, detail is better seen in the black and white uh, image than in the color image. The reason is that the color image is a combination of four fixes which are around, and therefore you lose, you lose some of the details, and this uh, uh, in decrease the uh, contrast that uh, we have been talking about. Not developed by Spectra Science and just approved by the FDA, brings laser technology to colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy. This new probe helps physicians determine immediately, with up to 96% accuracy, if any tissue is potentially cancerous. Well, this virtual biopsy device is a major breakthrough for us because this it will allow us to determine immediately biopsy. when we find a small polyp in the colon during screening sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy, whether it's a type of polyp that could lead to cancer and needs to be treated or further studies done. Many of them do not, so we can make that determination immediately. The non-invasive optical biopsy system uses an optical probe to excite and analyze tissue in the colon. The results are instantaneous. Because 50% of small polyps are non-cancerous, it is a great benefit to have this immediate interpretation to determine if removal is necessary. If the tissue is determined to be suspect, it is removed immediately at this early stage when survival rates are the highest. Well, I like the idea that uh, you can be uh, analyzed on the spot. It uh, certainly... Uh, okay, uh, this is, a, as I mentioned, uh, is a structure light, uh, one of the techniques uh, in order to get uh, better resolution and it's a structure light uh, based on a spectroscopy, so that means based on something which is not images. Uh, the only thing you get in here are curves of the concentration of substances which are in the area, and those curves are interpreted as benign or malignant according to uh, a training set that had been done in this system. Uh, this means that you do a colonoscopy, and immediately you detect if that polyp or any uh, area is suspicious or not. 
you uh, take the suspicious ones and you can leave the rest of the uh, items which are not so suspicious. Um, plus this, which is non-image uh, data, it is called also a spectroscopy when you use different colors, so that means different light spectrums or different uh, 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 image uh, um, uh, responses from the tissue. Uh, they, they call it also spectroscopy, although no, it's not the classical spectroscopy, it's another type of spectroscopy, which include also, uh, which include also the images. Uh, the classical one are these ones. Uh, this is multi-spectroscopy uh, in the sense that you get reflectance, polarization, cross-polarization, blue excitation, and ultraviolet excitation in the same area. This is the cervix uh, of a woman. And uh, from that you can see clearly, and we will see later on, that this is also used in the gastrointestinal uh, area. Uh, you can see uh, uh, from the image that uh, the details you get are different from one excitation light to another excitation light. And sometimes they... Um, tune all the excitation lines from one uh, uh, length light to another length light, or they automatically select, as we will see, a specific excitation li lines according to the tissue you are or the pathology you are seeing. The most interesting thing in here is that, as you can see, uh, when you have a lost fluorescence, this area uh, could be malignant. So that means that you have a lot of areas that you put biopsy in here because who knows if this area is maligna or this or this, although in general it is just in the uh, columnar squamous junction that you are going to biopsy. But in any case, the columnar junction is very relatively broad and you don't know where to biopsy in here, but when you... Uh, get an area such as this one, which uh, you have loss of fluorescence, and you can detect that this is exactly the area that you need to uh, biopsy. Uh, also, there are uh, some intelligent systems, uh, intelligent that uh, it is difficult to trust unless you know exactly how they work, uh, in which combining all these technologies, they select uh, not uh, visually, as you have seen in here, but electronically, which is the area of interest that you need to biopsy according to some uh, strange, let's say, parameters which are inside of the device. Um, let me tell you that according to the European laws, uh, these devices, although they pass the uh, European seal, uh, they are not able to be used on the real persons. Uh, most of these devices, nevertheless, they come from America and they have passed the FDA and the FDA uh, requirements are more or less similar to the uh, European mark, uh, C mark, therefore it will be easy to pass the European C mark. But uh, on the contrary, there are a lot of uh, European devices that will not pass the European label because they, they do not have uh, sufficient quality in order to pass the label. Um, uh, well, uh, another very important uh, application, which is non-image based, so it's based on the Fourier domain transformation curves, uh, obtain uh, f mm, uh, excitating the area with infrared. Uh, this is a very classical use uh, of a spectroscopy for detecting uh, malignant areas and uh, uh, in the cervix and in the bladder and in the colon uh, do arise a better specificity and sensitivity than the visual and the histological and the cytological uh, acquisitions. Uh, nevertheless, the people are afraid to implement it. Uh, they consider they do not have 
sufficient trials in order to be imposed, uh, let's see, as a better uh, testing system than the classical pap smear. Uh, this is the classical, uh, what is called chromoendoscopy, in which you change uh, different wavelengths from one uh, side to another of the spectrum, uh, but in general uh, you combine different uh, lengths on the red, green, and blue. Uh, this system, it's called intelligent, uh, comes from Fujinon, and is called intelligent because he decides by himself according what he sees on the on the on the tissue, which are the uh, length uh, wavelength that should be uh, ideal to discriminate the tissue area. And uh, well, uh, this is uh, classically uh, also called chromoendoscopy. Uh, here is one of the cases of chromoendoscopy. Uh, it is clear that without uh, changing the wavelength, you see less than changing the wavelength, you see more. In this case, it's not uh, a problem because it's just to see more or less the vessels, but obviously it's much more marking here, and the only difference is just the color excitation of the light, of the light, yes. Uh, furthermore, uh, plus changing the excitation color, uh, you can see that the vessels uh, and the hemoglobin are excited at the uh, 450 nanometers wavelength, uh, so this length mainly. So when you have a, a predominant of this length in the, uh, in the uh, excitation light, what you get is uh, vessels mainly. But far, uh, plus this ch uh, change on the uh, on the uh, wavelength, uh, you can also stain from the outside, improving your visibility of the lesions within the gocarnium. Uh, another uh, non-image technique that uh, is a spectroscopic and that has been pointed out already by uh, by Constantinus Pistris because he's very much interested to combine. Uh, Raman spectroscopy with optical coherence tomography. Uh, you have two types of Raman spectroscopy, the near infrared and the near infrared associated with a very high quality fiber, so hollow fiber in which there is no scattering inside of the fiber and therefore the quality and the uh, sensitivity and the signal to noise ra ratio is very high. The problem of the Raman spectroscopy is the low signal, and you have to have a very high quality, uh, high quality uh, fibers in order to get a better information. The thing is that uh, you get a series of cords uh, which are uh, different from the normal epithelium to the malignant epithelium. And if we are able to classify it uh, and uh, these differences are persistent in the trial, uh, then you can automatically classify what is the malignancy or the benignancy areas. And this is what we have been mentioned previously, that uh, probably in order to select in a, in a screening of the slight areas which are suspicious, will be better uh, to think on spectroscopy than of uh, artificial intelligence in order to identify the type of cells according to the patho patho patholo uh, patholog criteria. Uh, the better uh, resolution system, uh, as you have seen, uh, it will rise uh, point, uh, one, uh, 0.5 uh, um, microns, is the uh, confocal microscopy applied on living tissue, uh, generally uh, with endoscopy. Uh, the confocal microscopy uh, have a very low penetration, therefore, the ideal tissue is this tissue which is more or less uh, transparent, not very thick, uh, so you can see not only the surface, but you can see what is underneath, as is the case of the gastrointestinal tract. 
Uh, here are two images of the uh, confocal microscopy. Uh, one uh, is uh, malignant, the left one, and one is hyperplastic and benign, which is the right one. Uh, there are two many two main uh, fiber optical confocal images uh, right now in the market. One is the opted Optiscana and the other is the Selvizio. Uh, the Selvizio looks uh, smaller, although as you will see it is not, uh, than the Optiscan, which is a um, regular uh, colposcope, pentax, uh, oh, sorry, colposcope, endoscope, in which in the um, biopsy channel, instead of introducing the biopsy sampling uh, um, uh, cable or, uh, opt, uh, or fiber, you introduce a confocal microscopy fiber, which is that one. Uh, in general, the uh, diameter of those uh, fiber microscopes are 1.4, sufficient to be introduced uh, through the biopsy uh, hollow of a regular endoscope, uh, and contain uh, 30,000 fibers, each one of 1.9 microns. And uh, on the top, at the end, uh, there is an optics, a rod uh, lens, uh, which is the Green's lens, uh, in general, only 4.8 uh, plus uh, and uh, with a low numerical aperture because they are just detecting uh, low detail or low power detail like in the microscope. And the resolution achieved is around 3.5 microns. Now we will see is a newly developed diagnostic tool enabling in vivo histology during ongoing endoscopy. To create confocal images, blue laser light is focused on the desired tissue via the distal end of a Pentax endoscope. The special confocal optical system detects the fluorescing light, which produces high-resolution microscopic images. Handling of the endoscope is similar to that of a standard video endoscope. Confocal images are displayed simultaneously with video endoscopy images on two separate monitors. The endoscope is advanced over the esophagus. The blue laser beam is readily visible on the mucosal surface. Now the pylorus and the inflamed antrum are visible. 5 milliliters of fluorescein is injected as a contrast agent at a final concentration of 10%. Fluorescein is mandatory for endomicroscopic imaging. It highlights in vivo architecture of the mucosal layer, primarily vessel architecture. The fine capillary network in the antrum is readily visible due to the bright bands characterizing single capillaries. Dark spots within the capillaries represent red blood cells. Subsequently, a second dye is applied topically to the gastric surface. Acroflavin is sprayed with a spraying catheter onto the mucosa. Acroflavin highlights cell boundaries on the nuclei. In addition, Helicobacter pylori are brightly stained due to an active uptake of acroflavin. Accumulated as well as single germs can be readily visualized on the mucosal surface and between the gastric glands. Foveole gastrice, epithelial cells, and Heliobacter pylori can be differentiated. The typical shape and size of single H. pylori can be identified and could possibly allow endomicroscopic targeted biopsies after more research is conducted. The confocal endomicroscope is positioned in the lower left corner in the endoscopic view. During confocal imaging, suction can be applied through the working channel to the tissue in order to minimize moving artifacts. The working channel is localized at the right lower corner. Thus, biopsies should be targeted at the left side of the suction marks to obtain corresponding specimens for final histology. Ex vivo histology revealed Helicobacter positive gastritis. The patient was subsequently treated with antibiotics. Well, you see the technique. Uh, in uh, we see the technique in here. 
uh, that uh, in order to see the tissue, we have to make some contrast. Otherwise, it's impossible to distinguish the tissue itself. And the contrast is done mandatory with fluorescence in order to see the vessels, and also with a spray on surface with a, a acrofabin, or uh, with methylene blue, you will see later on. Uh, because the methylene blue mainly uh, stain the nuclei and the acroflavin uh, stain the boundary of the cells and also the bacteria, in this case, Helicobacter pylori, and on the second phase also stain the nuclei. But the mm, point of acroflavin is that it's um, mutagen. Uh, so that means you can use it for diagnostic, but not uh, in a repetitive manner. Um, uh, this is, uh, when you use colors, uh, so dyes, like uh, indigo, carmine indigo, or methylene blue, uh, you can call also this chromoendoscopy because you just not, not only see it macroscopically in color, but you also see stain the nuclei inside of the endoscopy. Year old male patient is scheduled for chromoendoscopy and endomicroscopy because of dysphagia. Subtle irregularities are visible in the middle third of the esophagus. Some nodularities and shallow ulceration are present. Lugol's solution is sprayed onto the surface using a spraying catheter. The iodine within the solution binds with glycogen within normal squamous epithelium and leads to a brown colorization of the surface epithelium. Neoplastic and inflamed areas remain unstained. A large area of unstained mucosa becomes visible after intravital staining. The borders between the suspected neoplastic lesion and the normal squamous epithelium can be easily identified. Chromoendoscopy is used to unmask the area of interest. Subsequently targeted endomicroscopy can be performed. The endomicroscopic window is positioned in the lower left corner within the endoscopic field of view. Images can be obtained following gentle contact and pressure with the endomicroscopic window at the mucosal surface. Fluorescein is injected as a contrast agent for endomicroscopy. Well, Squamous vessel. epithelium is displayed as gray cells with low contrast. However, capillaries are brightly highlighted in the lamina propria. Here, irregular and twisted tumor vessels can be identified. This Changes in vessel architecture... It's on time, so that means that you, it's changes. moving. Vessel it's not a very nice image that you have seen previously. ...using additional buttons of the endoscope control body. Subsequently, acroflavin staining is used to further characterize cell architecture. Acroflavin is also applied over a spraying catheter. Acroflavin highlights surface cells. Nuclei and cell membranes become readily visible. The normal squamous epithelium looks bright with homogeneous and very bright nuclei. Malignant cell changes are rather dark and irregular. Confocal images are displayed every 0.8 seconds. The number of moving artifacts can be minimized by gentle pressure of the distal tip of the endoscope onto the mucosal surface and by continuous suctioning. After stabilization is reached, suspected areas can be imaged over the whole imaging plane depth. Here, irregular cell architecture indicates squamous cell carcinoma. The different confocal images can be digitally captured with the help of a foot pedal. Online obtained images can also be reassessed at any time after the procedure. Here, the tumor vessel seen after the application of fluorescein is further magnified and colorized. Malignant, irregular and dark changes are seen in contrast to bright normal cell architecture of squamous epithelium after local acroflavin application. In the magnified mode, single cells with normal nuclei are marked with an arrow at the right. The malignant changes are highlighted with a second arrow at the left. Endomicroscopic guided biopsies revealed a poorly differentiated squamous cell cancer. Okay, so that means that we can do chromoendoscopy. Uh, in this case, it's like a screening endoscopy in the sense that uh, you stain the area with glucol, iodine, in order to mark the areas that contain glycogen, which are the normal cells, 
And those areas that does not contain glycogen could be uh, pathological or malignant. And furthermore, you do microscopy with cyclophlebin and fluorescein in order to see the areas of uh, malignancy transition. As you, as you have seen, there are some uh, malignancy. But furthermore, uh, you can also immunostain uh, the fluorescence uh, so make, make uh, immunofluorescence with the specific antibodies. Uh, some of uh, those antibodies could be or could determine or could detect specifically pre-malignant or malignant areas. Therefore, you can go directly and selective to uh, the area of interest. Uh, how are you currently imaging the lungs? Frozen in an x-ray image? Or under a CT scan? Inside the bronchus using a bronchoscope? Or outside the patient's body analyzing samples under a microscope? Selvisio Lung opens a new world in pulmonology with in vivo, in situ imaging of the entire bronchioalveolar tract with microscopic resolution. Salvisio by Monarchia Technologies. For endoscope stop, Salvisio Lung begins. Salvisio Lung enables doctors to safely reach distal areas in the lung. It produces reliable, ultra-high resolution images of the alveoli, the alveoli as it vivo. lives and breathes. Breathing. Of the imaging modalities currently available, none can produce live microscopic images of the alveoli in real time. Standard bronchoscopes cannot reach the distal lung, and obtaining biopsies can be risky. Even when samples are safely taken from the patient's body, Histology cannot provide functional or dynamic information. One of the problems when you see the lung pathology is that when you cut it, you scratch it, you, uh, and the area, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, alveolar area is uh, uh, completely uh, crushed. L'aspect que l'on voit sur une coupe de poumon est une, un aspect de deux dimensions et qui est celle d'un poumon non seulement non aéré, mais également d'un poumon qui n'a pas son architecture dans les, dans les trois dimensions telles qu'il doit l'être. Salvisial lung begins where bronchoscopes stop. It can reach the alveoli and visualize their dynamic process at a microscopic level. Specifically designed for microscopic observation in the lung, the system comprises a laser scanning unit, the Alveoflex Confocal Mini Probe, and a proprietary image processing software. The physician performs a standard endoscopy procedure. When the bronchoscope reaches its access limit, the alveoscopy procedure begins. The Alveoflex is inserted into the operating channel of the bronchoscope and extended further into the terminal bronchi or alveoli. The tip had been graduated for landmarking purposes and to further ensure patient safety. Since the, the cell, the, the tissue is transparent, you don't need to uh, manipulate it, you don't need to punch it, nothing at all. You just put the light on the surface, that's all. And this is what you see. You see the alveoli breathing. At the heart of the Selvisio system lies a unique patented laser scanning unit, LSU. The LSU integrates a blue laser diode. Its beam travels via a system of lenses and mirrors, thinning it to a micron scale diameter. At the end of its course, the beam is injected into the Alveoflex mini probe's fibers with unprecedented scanning accuracy and speed. The Alveoflex Confocal Mini Probe 
is 1.4 millimeters in diameter and is comprised of 30,000 optical fibers. The core of each fiber is 1.9 micron. Each fiber is injected 12 times per second in a rapid sequence, one after the other. The laser beam travels through the fibers of the confocal mini probe until it reaches the area to be examined within the patient's body. The laser scans a 600 micron area of living tissue and the resulting lateral resolution is 3.5 microns. Selvisial lung takes advantage of the naturally occurring fluorescence of the lung revealed by the blue laser. The light re-emitted by the scanned area is collected by the confocal mini probe and guided back to the LSU. With its proprietary software and image processing algorithm, it produces real-time microscopic video images of alveoli that are viewed on screen and recordable. Selvisial lung is the result of six years of research and development by Monikea Technologies in France. A multidisciplinary team of professionals from the fields of biology, medical optics, astrophysics, imaging processing, and computer engineering work together with a singular objective to provide clinicians with innovative, minimally invasive imaging devices that improve pulmonary patients' lives in routine procedures. Selvisial lung has the CE. Okay, you see this uh, probe which is inside of the endoscope for the lung looks uh, smaller than the one we have seen on the Pentax, uh, on the uh, Optoscan. Uh, but it, it's exactly the same size. Uh, it's 1.4 millimeters and uh, 30K uh, number fibers of 1.9 microns each one and the same resolution as the previous one. But uh, the coating uh, is uh, almost transparent and very thin, so therefore it looks like one, only one fiber, which in fact they have uh, uh, 30,000 fibers. Uh, scanning the area. Mm, obviously, now there are confocal uh, probes in which there is only a single fiber. Uh, this single fiber have to have a lot of uh, a very high quality uh, on the material in order not to spread and lose the light. Now we come to another type of, uh, of uh, structure light system for uh, spectroscopy and real biopsy. And this is the, uh, the uh, video endoscopic capsule. This is a pill that you swallow and it goes through the intestine uh, taking images from the intestine. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, uh, the first generation was the uh, mm, M2A from Imaging Technologies, I think is the name. Uh, now the second generation is from Olympus, Norica and Sayaka is the one you, we are seeing in here. Uh, this, uh, the, the Olympus is the less evoluted one because as you can see, the um, camera is on uh, the top, on one vertex, and the most developing ones, the camera is uh, lateral placed, and the reason why is lateral placed, you will see here, is because uh, meanwhile they are rotating, and they are rotating because they have uh, in here, I mean, they do not have... Um, uh, power inside, sorry, they have power but they do not have uh, batteries inside of the pill. Uh, they have, uh, uh, they are charged from the electromagnetic field from outside and the electromagnetic field from outside which is handled by the patient, these are the leads by the way, these are the leads uh, that can be different type of leads for fluorescent leads, white leads, uh, different type of wavelengths in order to do spectroscopy. Uh, so these um, are charged from the outside, and meanwhile they are charged, they are rotating the pill. Therefore, meanwhile they are moving through the intestine, he is rotating and getting charged, and taking uh, pictures from everywhere. 
obviously they are coated. Uh, and uh, at the present moment, meanwhile, they are using uh, uh, radio frequency ID in order not to lose the device inside of the intestine, especially when they have stenosis. So you will see how it works. It is rotating and discharge it and move the pill around and taking pictures from all over around. So they are not only tracking but also taking pictures from all over around. And these are the leads of different colors. Uh, this is only useful for the in, uh, small intest intestine because the lumen is uh, relatively small, uh, but in the large intestine, uh, the pill move around and get lost. You can have, if you are lucky, some pictures, but uh, probably of not very good quality. Esophagus. A stomach also you get lost more or less, although this pill is tracked from the outside so you can move it in such a manner that uh, you can uh, uh, push it on the lateral walls and therefore take um, better pictures. But obviously in the small intestine is very fine because the, the, the walls of the intestine are uh, touching the surface of the pill and you are taking pictures all over around, and thereafter you build it as a mosaic, like here. You stitch and build a mosaic. is very high and you are taking different pictures you are sending the pictures outside obviously this is a wireless connection and uh, in outside in the system outside the, the pictures are getting built in a mosaic form One of the problems of these capsules is they, they can get stuck somewhere. And in order to avoid uh, to uh, get the capsule lost, uh, not because it's a problem to get it lost, because it doesn't matter. It's, uh, now I, I think that they reuse it. Initially it was one, one use only. Uh, the problem is that they can block uh, the, the gastrointestinal transit, particularly when there is a neoplasma. That is the reason why the, the, four, uh, the 4G, the, the fourth generation type of uh, capsule is built with legs in order to um, impulse themselves inside. And not only that, but also not only is built with legs, but is also built with some kind of devices that can go from the inside to outside, take, uh, um, take the biopsy. Uh, the capsule is almost empty. Uh, so that means that you can put inside a lot of things. You can put treatment, you can put uh, immunodetectors, you can put a lot of things inside of the pill in order to make the, the diagnosis. And uh, the system is tracked and moved, uh, although this is the Olympus, the, the previous generation, but in any case, the system is tracked and moved uh, from the outside with an electromagnetic field and, you, and, and, and in outside you can, you can see the images directly. Another type of uh, images you can get uh, are uh, the interferometric technology uh, that build uh, images. There are a lot of techniques uh, of interferometry including single fiber interferometry in which they use 
uh, photonic crystal fibers, optical coherence tomography, as we have seen, uh, optical coherence microscopy, and full field optical coherence uh, tomography. The uh, difference uh, in microscopy obviously depends on the greens, uh, that means the numerical aperture of the, uh, of the, uh, of the optics, which are uh, on the top of the fiber. Uh, this is a case of a single fiber, single fiber uh, interferometry. Uh, in the microscope, uh, uh, optical coherence uh, tomography, your greens, uh, your numerical aperture is less than, uh, sorry, is more than 0 0.5, and the greens can uh, get even uh, up to 1.2. But obviously, if you have a lot of detail, your penetration is less, so you have to move in between what are the needs inside of the, uh, the medical application. Uh, optical coherence tomography, as you have seen in the previous uh, talks, uh, have improved a lot, but mainly have improved through the type of uh, light source uh, from the uh, super luminescent uh, diodes to the uh, laser pulsed uh, uh, and the ultrafast uh, laser pulsed. Uh, this is the last, uh, latest generation that have an ultra high uh, uh, resolution up to 0.5 micrometers. So it's a very good resolution that allows you to uh, obtain uh, almost microscopic images from the uh, things you are uh, viewing. Uh, but uh, interesting enough is the fact that even using halogen lamps, uh, in a macroscopic view optical coherence tomography, uh, you can have a very good resolution. You can have a, an optics of 10 per uh, with a numerical aperture of 0.3, and with a spectral coding of the uh, images you get, uh, you can have a, uh, like a full biopsy or uh, histological image of the area you are seeing. The uh, most um, advanced technologies include the, uh, op as we have seen uh, yesterday or the day before, the uh, optical frequency domain imaging, so the Fourier transform uh, domain, which is a lot of uh, computer consuming in an uh, imaging uh, rotating system. So uh, the, uh, the uh, top of the catheter rotates and uh, furthermore move the wavelength uh, from uh, 1,200 up to 1,400 nanometers. Uh, getting all that information simultaneously, so the imaging around a thousand points at the same time. And the uh, latest uh, system, which still have difficulties due to the speed, uh, the lack of speed in order to obtain information from the interferometer imaging system, is the terahertz interferometer imaging. Well, this is the uh, type of uh, data you get in the ultra-high resolution optical coherence tomography, uh, either in endoscopy, so meaning uh, in surface areas, uh, or uh, inside in surface areas, or in fibroscopy, meaning that you punch, you uh, put the uh, coherence tomograph uh, inside of a needle and you put it and you, you punch the, the surface in order to get information from the inside body. Uh, what is uh, nice from that uh, is that um, you can obtain information without, uh, uh, without needing to have uh, real physical biopsies. For example, in here, you can see if uh, the uh, area of breast you are cutting in a breast surgery is uh, free or not of tumor. In here is free of tumor, therefore there is no problem, you can cut. And in here, uh, the area has a tumor, therefore you cannot cut. And this is the histological image uh, from the area you are cutting. 
and therefore you have to go uh, further on in order to cut. It is clear that the quality of the images you get cannot be compared with the confocal microscopy we have seen, but uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, particularly for, um, for internal organs for in fibroscopy, you get images that are quite similar to the uh, microscopic ones, and therefore they have sufficient quality for making diagnosis, particularly when you are looking of the uh, sentinel lymph node, if this is have neoplasia or no in order to perceive the, uh, the surgery. Uh, they are, uh, the, uh, nevertheless, uh, smart uh, uh, image analysis techniques in order to improve a lot the quality of those images. And you can see here that with this interferometry scientific aperture microscope, uh, you get uh, the image uh, focus even uh, in deep, and uh, furthermore, uh, you get details which are similar to the histology. And in, even in the, uh, if you use an allergen lamp in the full field optical coherence microscopy, you can coat the uh, image in a spectral manner in uh, hue saturation and luminance and get a detail of the, uh, for example, epithelium that looks like an histology. Uh, and you get, in fact, a uh, re lateral resolution of 1.4. Therefore, if you are using this system for colposcopy, this is uh, quite fine. Another uh, new technique, which is uh, a little bit uh, far from what the pathologists expect on the images to see, is the holographic techniques, although uh, on molecular point of view, it must be of a lot of help. Uh, this is the uh, holographic imaging, holographic uh, uh, microscopy, and quantum holography. In the quantum holography, the light you are using are electrons. Uh, therefore, the information you get as, uh, is very small. It's at the quantum limit. The interesting thing uh, for some medical applications of the holography as, is that you correct a lot of uh, uh, viewing problems uh, uh, of the area. So you correct for uh, um, uh, deepness of the image, you correct for lateral deformation, lateral vision, and therefore in some areas like, for example, in breast or even uh, when you are planning surgery in the, in the spine, uh, an holographic uh, imaging display on particular monitors as this one uh, could be of uh, interest. Uh, there are also holography as you will see in microscopy, but this is for the biological area and far for us. Also, it's far for us, although extremely important uh, for medicine and uh, for genetic therapy and things like that, all the area uh, of nonlinear illumination that uh, built uh, chemical microscope. What means nonlinear illumination? Means that the uh, incident light uh, do not have, uh, is not reflected, is different from the light that you receive, is non-linearly received. Um, and you have the cars, the coherent anti-stroke ram and scattering, cars confocal, non-linear interferometric vibrating imaging. Those things, they detect the vibration of the molecules. So, in fact, they are chemical uh, microscope, not really imaging microscope. You have one photon, two photon endoscopy, second harmonic endoscopy, near field scanical optical microscopy, in which you have to have the uh, sample very uh, uh, close to the area of uh, electron beam. Uh, but you get, uh, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, a very high resolution of 20 nanometers, the scattering uh, uh, near field scanning microscope, and obviously the atomic force microscope. But the interesting thing uh, are the hybrid methods. Uh, although I already mm, asked uh, Constantinos Petris if he has experience on the PAM, on the photoacoustic microscopy, 
I didn't get a clear answer of what he had said. Uh, the only thing that was clear to me is that this is very expensive, <laughs> uh, which I don't know exactly why. It doesn't look to me that it should be, but in any case. Uh, there are three uh, types, and I want to pay attention on all the three because they are very interesting. Uh, particularly the middle one, I don't have images from the middle one because this is a very recent one, and let's say it's a very stupid method, <laughs> but, but uh, it gets a resolution of three nanometers, <laughs> which is a lot. And the stupid method is that they uh, put on the top one image focus uh, in different focus on Z, uh, on Z, uh, um, on Z uh, localization. Huh? So you have you 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 take a several images on different Z localization, and you make the difference between those images. And this difference uh, will allow you to get uh, three nanometer differences. So you can you can detect uh, things which are. Uh, very, very small. This is the true focus scanning optical microscope imaging. It's just uh, um, subtracting images in different Z uh, positions. Mm? Obviously, in a very nice and very uh, precise scanning system on Z position, but uh, it's, uh, let's say, it's a very stupid method and uh, 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 they get a very good results. Uh, more uh, intelligent methods are the PAM, the photoacoustic microscopy, particularly this one, and the diffuse optical tomography, that is a functional near-infrared uh, tomography. Uh, you get, uh, you excite the area, for example, the breast uh, with near-infrared, you get the optical uh, density image, uh, you get the second derivative uh, uh, of this image, and Thereafter, you code the different wavelength in the spectral window. The spectral window has already been uh, bringed uh, by Constantinos Pitis, and in fact, I took these images from him. The spectral window is from 700 to 900 nanometers wavelength, and is a window where uh, the hemoglobin almost do not scatter, the uh, water uh, also do not make any, uh, any information, and the tissue scattering is in the middle point. Uh, when you code it, when you code it uh, the four wavelengths, uh, the, the, there are only four codes in here, four colors, if you cut the four wavelengths, uh, you get uh, details which are uh, not seen in normal even mammographies. Uh, and this is a cancer uh, in, in this area uh, here of less than five millimeters of diameter. Hmm? Uh, obviously, you can mark also the things with beacons. Uh, you can mark molecules uh, which uh, can be excited with the infrared. Uh, in order that they go directly to the areas of interest, and then you uh, do the dot, the diffuse optical tomography, and then you see where those areas have been uh, deposited. Uh, the nice thing of the uh, photoacoustic microscopy that we will see immediately is that this is an ultrasound technique. Therefore, they get the penetration of the ultrasound, they get three centimeters of penetration, but they have the res lateral resolution of almost a microscope. Uh, this is based on the fact that if you use a very short pulse laser in a, in a tissue, uh, you get a vibrating wave from the tissue. And this vibrating wave, uh, which is a thermoelastic expansion of photoacoustic wave, can be detected by an ultrasound probe. Uh, and uh, with a high quality ultrasound probe uh, of uh, uh, 5 millihertz, uh, you can, and, and 800 nanometers light, you can get uh, a deepness because the, the, the nice uh, thing of this uh, system is the super depth. 
uh, with a high uh, lateral resolution, you have a super depth uh, resolution, and this is the images you can get. There are very few images. This is the only one I could uh, bring for, uh, for presentation. Now, uh, this is what we get in non-invasive techniques. We get images uh, that, besides the spectral images, are close to the pathology area. The, uh, this is one of the reasons why the endoscopy, so the doctors do not feel comfortable on doing this, or uh, self-sufficient for making a diagnosis, because they are not really trained on, on morphology as the pathology is. Therefore, this should be, uh, be supported by pathology, not physically in the area of the endoscopy, but at least at distance. Uh, and the problem is uh, the way uh, the pathology uh, have to be trained. Uh, the, and I'm going to show you two slides of the way the uh, uh, knowledge uh, comes to medicine. Uh, they are very funny slides because you will see that the knowledge of pathology are different from the knowledge of the rest of doctors. The way we get the information is not similar to the rest of doctors. Uh, the first slide is the, let's say, no good uh, uh, based knowledge for doctors. But they, these are knowledge that exist. I mean, there are doctors that base their knowledge on eminence, on vehemence, on eloquence, on providence, on loss of confidence. Uh, so, I mean, instead of being, no, no, this is that, in order not to show that he is not sure of what he is doing. Uh, nervous based, this is very clear in medicine. Confident based, just the opposite, those which are very self confident and are sure of everything. And it comes now that it's web based. And many of the medical doctor wave based medicine uh, are brought by the patients themselves because they go to web and they, they uh, even learn more than the doctors when they are in the school of medicine. So these are uh, issues that have to be taken into consideration. Now they come the higher level of knowledge or, let's say, the more scientific part of the knowledge in which the medicine is based. Uh, but some of them, it looks really suspicious, even though. They are preference-based, uh, and this is more related with the schools. There are schools that uh, behave in this way or behave in the other way or made the diagnosis in this way or made the diagnosis in the other way. They are uh, subjective uh, judgment, uh, and this is clear. Uh, everyone knows that uh, you can make a diagnosis as soon as one patient comes into your room. Uh, it's fully subjective, but it's uh, regarded or based on uh, knowledge that you have from behind. They are consensus-based, uh, which I don't like at all, by the way. Uh, they are outcome-based, which I like better, and then the top of the top, uh, and on which uh, everyone is going to be basing the medicine up to now, which is the evidence-based medicine. So you have sufficient experience in order to assure that, that what you are saying or the treatment you are putting is the correct one. Then it comes the pathology knowledge. The pathology knowledge, the gold standard for the pathology, are completely different from the rest of the doctors. They do not care on the evidence, because the evidence at the present moment is not available. Uh, they, are, they are based on experience. Uh, they found the knowledge, the only way they have found the knowledge is from the literature, and the only way to find the knowledge in the literature is just seeing images, because there is no way to, I mean, you can, you can learn on the literature uh, medical-based evidence of the follow-up of a patient that had been treated with that and that and that, but you cannot base your uh, knowledge of pathology unless you see the image. 
So you are based your knowledge on the image comparisons. And this is the reason why uh, we are uh, pushing so much the project of uh, training pathology quick with imaging comparison quick in order to uh, have uh, as much as possible uh, have the pathology trained on a new tool as, as this one. Obviously, there is an eminent role. I mean, in pathology, everyone knows that they say this is this because I, I say that this is this. That's all. Full stop. <laughs> no question about. And this is this because I'm an eminence on the area of the pathology we are talking about. Uh, the, this is based on interpretation, uh, which is obviously uh, nothing to do with evidence. You just interpret the things in the way you think they should be interpreted according to your experience and the images you have seen previously. And uh, you have a, a sixth sense or sexto sentido in Castellano. Uh, that when you see something, it, oh, this smells to me like a neoplasia. And probably your first impression is the right one. <laughs> so you mean that the, uh, the knowledge of the pathology doesn't have anything to do with the uh, real nice knowledge? Oops, no. Ah, sorry. The real nice knowledge, which is the evidence-made knowledge. So pathology are not uh, guiding for that. Therefore, uh, how can we provide the knowledge to the pathologist? And I say to the pathologist because the endoscopist uh, do behave in a different manner. I mean, these are not based on images. They are based on evidence-based medicine. So how can you bring the knowledge to the pathology? The only way to bring the knowledge to the pathology is to bring sufficient image comparisons and even to leave the system automatically to find the comparisons in order to bring to them to make the diagnosis. And this is everything for today. Thank you very much.